Hi guys, we're live. This is Dustin Dye, and I've got a good friend of mine, Maddie, with me, who I'll have introduce herself in a second. But before we get started, I have three random questions just to kind of set the mood. Well, we already kind of set the mood with, with these matching blazers that I, I think we look pretty fly. But uh, you got a nice little pocket you went up me, but I put a little little button thing on. Nice. Not at all fancy. Yeah, so I'm going to start with three just super random questions, set the mood. First one is, favorite movie robot? TARS. TARS, okay. If you're at, which house are you of Harry Potter? Oh, that's a good question. I would say I'd love to be like a mix of Hufflepuff and Gryffindor. Okay, okay. What about you? Fair enough. Uh, I'm more of a Gryffindor, I think. Yeah, nice. Uh, and favorite Disney princess? Oh, that's a good one. I'd have to say uh, Mulan. Mulan. Oh, the new Mulan. movie's coming out. Have you seen commercials? I know. I've, see, I've seen the trailer. It was supposed to be released last month, right? But didn't, unfortunately. Not a huge problem on the large scale of things, but uh, it's been like do like an in-home premiere release or something, right? Like a lot of people are doing now, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited for it. The, the trailer looked really good, not yeah. gonna lie. Okay, let's jump into things. Um, brought Maddie here today. You wanna just go ahead and introduce yourself now that we know all about your house and movie <laughs> selections? That really is the most important information, but yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm a senior uh, AI evangelist now for Raza, uh, but I'm also a machine learning engineer and I've been spending a few years building ML-driven products um, for the enterprise. Well, it's good to have you here. Do you want to talk, let's, let's kick things off because you've been in the space for a while now as well. We talk about from like 2016 where there was a ton of bot hype to now you're working with Raza, the NLU space is, is growing and just like what, what's going on? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think, I think you put it really well. Like from 2016, we started to ride the hype cycle of chatbots and we saw this proliferation of chatbots and yeah. made predictions like, you know, apps were gonna be replaced by bots. So we saw a lot of that, but then immediately we saw this huge backlash, I think in 2017 and 2018, where, you know, you, you, you talk to an FAQ bot, it starts to answer your questions, but you ask a follow-up question or you say something that doesn't follow, you know, the standard if else logic and it fails. So there was mm. this backlash, right, against chatbots because it didn't effectively meet expectations, which is it couldn't do everything that the user wanted to, to do with a chatbot. Um, do you so, think part of that backlash was because of the complexity that was overlooked? Like it was just harder than people thought to build a bot. So they just, kind of trashed it. They're like, ah, this isn't as easy as like AI sounds like it right. probably won't work. Exactly. Everyone was like, oh, AI is this magical thing. It's going to be able to do everything. And I think they started to, to look at building bots the way they look at building software, which can be simpler, right? Because building a web application or like a website is relatively, I think, easier because it's more well-defined. There's lots of, you know, maturity in terms of experience and tools or something like that. So I think that... Yeah was overlooked and the expectation that AI could do just everything or machine learning would be able to do for everything, which I think wasn't necessarily um, you know, really looked into. And I think that's a problem that you have when, when you have like a, a chatbot or a conversation AI application, you compare it to humans. And humans are really good at, you know, handling unexpected user behavior or recovering gracefully from something that's unanticipated or unexpected. And you compare that with an actual human conversation, which is what mm -hmm. a lot of folks did. Uh, and so there was that huge, huge gap. But, you know, it goes back to your point in that conversational AI is hard, you know? It's a yeah. problem to solve. You made a good comparison with like web development. Um, you know, web development's been around for a while now, so there's more people that have experience there. Do you think part of the reason that from 2016 till now, that learning curve is just there, there wasn't that many engineers, developers, and also like the creative side, um, designers, copywriters, 
things like that that were that were working together and yeah or do you think they're, they're yeah because you need you need like a product team to build you know a conversational ai application so let's say you're trying to build something that's mission critical like automating a portion of help desk calls right so that's your goal and you want to build a bot that is able to do that so you know the recommended approach is to build an faq or a minimum viable assistant where you have a bunch of happy path coverage like you know a few conversations where you know the users are going to answer it and you have them. but it's also like you said how do you design that conversation you know how do you can probably chart out a few hypothetical conversations, right? Which is, I think, what conversation design and bot copy is all about. Um, but then you want to be able to also test it with real users um, because real users have a way of surprising you and really asking things that you may not have entered into your training data. So you have additional training data that you can use to build something more robust and more performant. Um, and it's also trying to do things just like you would for any software application is, you know, automating your CI CD and automating deployments um, and using like a UI, right, to, to visualize and collect conversations, to annotate and tag your data. And then you feed that back to the model and you have like a continuous learning cycle. And, and when you have conversations that you can't, um, that you don't know how to handle just yet, I think Bot Copy does a great job of this is like having your buttons and chips and other UI options to nudge the user back onto a happy path. So you need you know, a team to be able to really take this to production because building POCs are easy. And with POCs, you don't really uncover a lot of the hard problems that you do when you go to production or when you test it with, with test users or real users. Yeah, let's let's talk about the, there's a lot there. Let's talk about the POC for a second because you've got experience not only now with Rasa but have also worked with some really large enterprise clients. Um, what is let's let's take a step back from the POC. Let's say before the POC, like what kind of team, like would you if you could whip up the perfect team like today to have a hundred thousand dollar budget to get a POC off the ground. What would the team include? Like, what would it look like? And for the POC, you mentioned FAQs and things like that. How would you, where would you start? Yeah, no, great question. So when we're talking about like the ideal team makeup or dream team, I think for this, you, you definitely need a minimum of- You need blue suits. Sorry, what's that? You need blue suits. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, you need a, a team of like four or five people, right? You you definitely need business representation. You need like a business analyst or someone like that. Someone's able to effectively communicate with the business in terms of what the goals are. And then you help set those goals, which is, all right, we're going to automate 35% of help desk calls. And that's the goal. And we also want to, I don't know, modernize the workplace or something like that. Um, and then when it comes to actually building out this application, you need uh, one or two data engineers, someone that's really able to, especially when we're talking about enterprises, enterprises have a ton of data. And when we talk about innovation, people don't necessarily look at enterprises or look to enterprises in that they're, they're innovating a whole lot. But that's not actually true because they have a ton of data and that we now have the technical capabilities to tell a really good story with this data, right? So you need someone to be able to clean and process and pre-process your data. So you need a couple of data engineers. You also need uh, actual like software developers that can do integrations with third-party services because it's great if you have a chatbot that can answer your questions, but if it can actually do things for you, like open a ticket for you by integrating with ServiceNow or just set up a meeting for you um, by integrating with, with Outlook or G Suite or something like that. That drives true value. So you need someone to do these integrations. You need you know, uh, one or two DevOps engineers to handle your CI CD pipeline, automate deployments and things like that. But you also need a project manager, um, just like you would for any software application project. Um, and you also need a copywriter, someone to do conversation design and to figure out how your bot should respond to things. And as you start collecting data, you know, improve your bot's responses 
and make all of that better. So I think an ideal team would have representation from, from, from data, from development, DevOps, project management, and conversation design. Yeah, when, when before the POC, like you, you're getting it kicked off, what kind of data sets typically do you look at? I mean, with, with bot copy, um, so we're focused primarily on the like, website and front end. So sometimes that design is going to be a little bit different than if you're gearing up for like a voice assistant that's only going to be on speakers or maybe even a Facebook messenger that might have more of a marketing play. But what, what have you see, typically seen? Like, where do they start? We've looked at like calls that have been recorded for quality purposes, emails we've gone through to try to get a general feeling of the FAQs, but where, where have you started? Yeah, I mean, we've, so when, after we have like an initial goal of doing something, whether that's like automating a portion of these help desk calls, or maybe, increasing your card abandonment rate by like percent which when you're talking about like a large retail that can be you know huge in terms of cost saving and you know revenue and productivity and things like that so after you have your goal which will be the purpose of your bot we start looking at um call center recorded conversations we look at emails just like you said we also try to study you know the team's behavior uh if it's a help desk assistant that's supposed to you know, answer routine technical issues. In addition to looking at what the most common issues are that the current help desk team deals with, you know, what are uh, the things that the help desk team works on on a day-to-day -day basis that is repeatable that you could automate with a chatbot, um, allowing the help desk team to focus on like L2 and higher priority uh, cases that definitely need human intervention. Um, you know, if you're talking about like e-commerce, you know, what is it that customer service representatives do on a day-to-day -day basis that is repeatable that if you could automate very easily and seamlessly would allow them to focus on, on you know, things that aren't mundane and things that actually need human intervention. So we also study, you know, the team's behavior and figure out what we can automate. That's, you nailed it. One of my favorite things about some of the bot projects that we've seen is not that it is necessarily replacing jobs. It's, it's moving people into a new job or a new opportunity. It's like the mission critical things that you were, you were talking about, or if you're answering repetitive tasks, now you can put, you can jump on a call that actually needs more of a human response and understanding like something went wrong or um, a lot of the times like dealing with money and, and, and transactions like that sometimes really needs like a, um, Human on the other line, it just makes it a little more feel a little more secure. What if when you see bots, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but bots that are designed to have strong human and, and live chat handover versus bots that have been created to be almost a hundred percent deflection. Like what's what's like a good point? When is do you hand off the baton a little bit too early, maybe to a live chat team where the bot can handle that? And how do you kind of work to a point where it just gets a little bit less and less? What have you seen in that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because I, I don't think we have, uh, I think we're trying to solve that balance and that problem together. And mm -hmm. every, you know, every, every few weeks or so, months or so, we like learn something new when we start to collect feedback that tells us, okay, we can probably hand this task over to a bot too, right? Um, and, you know, Alan and Alex, the CTO and CEO of Raza, like to talk about how if you really want to build um, a good bot, you have to build that first. And I think it's true, and that's what we've seen in my experience even before I joined Raza, is that you want to be able to create an, a minimum viable assistant that, let's say it's a help desk assistant. If it can answer the top 10 questions that people ask it, and if it can do like the top one or two things that people need solved. If it's like opening a ticket or something like that, that was pretty popular. So that's the example that comes to mind is that, all right, so this bot can answer these 10 questions and it can open a ticket for you. And that's good. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect before you release it to really real users and like release it to the option. Cause you only learn how you can improve it based on the conversations that you get, based on how it fails and based on, you know, the feedback that you get. So I would say like release it as soon as you can. Don't wait until you think it's perfect uh, because then you have a great opportunity to make those improvements because 
uh, it's our guiding principle that real conversations are, are better than hypothetical ones. So you could come up with lots of hypothetical conversation paths, but it might not it, it might not work or it might not really match real user expectations because people will surprise you and ask you things or um, ask follow-up questions or digress from a happy path and change their mind and say, actually, no, I don't want to open the ticket. Um, so what do you do when you can't necessarily plan for things like that, right? So, um, so it helps to like hand this over to real users. And when you see something that's mission critical, that's failing, then obviously you want to hand that over to a, an actual like live agent that can then help solve that problem. Like if it's a refund and the bot doesn't understand what that is or how to do it, um, uh, like you mentioned with like things involving money and things like that, it probably makes sense to hand over to a live agent. Yeah. What, what, is, what are some of the things that you've seen fail when, in POC stage? Like what are the top things that, okay, this, is, this happened, this probably isn't a good thing, we could have avoided it by doing this. Have you seen like a, a common denominator of projects that just didn't do well because of some specific reasoning or is it a little random or the team or just wasn't planned out right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, they fail for a few. The most common ones I've seen is if you don't have, you know, an effective team that can do it, like if you only give it to one or two developers or, you know, a project manager and you say, well, this is a low code or no code platform. And so you can probably yeah. put something together and push it to production. We've found that clicking together a chatbot doesn't necessarily work. You do need good conversation design. You know, and you do need these UI options that can, you know, if you click a button, it, it will nudge the user back onto a happy path. And you do need, um, you know, tools that allow you to make your application more robust. So having an ideal team that can build a mission critical assistant is, is important. And when you don't have that, chances are it might not always, you know, work well. Um, some of the other reasons why chatbot projects can fail is if you spend too much time trying to make it better and make it perfect, because that's the way we've been trained to build applications um, is that you want to wait until it is so perfect before you release it to production. And I think that makes sense for like an e-commerce website. You obviously don't want to release like, you know, a search engine or, you know, like an e-com shop when it, there, you know that there, it's going to fail or when you know that there are so many bugs in it. But, and so you can't necessarily use that conventional wisdom when it comes to chatbots because you have to be able to release a chatbot and learn from those real user conversations to make it better. So yeah. I think that when you have these very rigid intents or you spend too much time trying to make it perfect by carving out all of these conversation paths, um, when you have like a bunch of rules and if else statements uh, for your bot to recover or, or go off of, um, we've seen that sometimes it fails because uh, in the real world, you know, it's not gonna follow those rules. So those are two things that we've seen fail. And I think another reason is if you start collecting feedback and you don't have uh, like, a, like an effective feedback loop, you don't necessarily implement the feedback that you get and make those iterative developments and improvements, your chatbot is not gonna keep it. Because if you stop teaching it, it's gonna stop learning. So you have to make those continuous improvements as you, as you go on. Yeah, I think from those that feedback as well, it tells you a lot about the company. Like maybe potential pivots, you know, what you what more customers are actually interested that you think about. Um, well, we often talk about how some of the best bots on the market are the bots that know what they don't know and, and have like the strongest default messaging where if it messes up or if it doesn't know something, it has a very sound way to either loop them back into asking another question or, or assuring the the customer on the other end that you know it, it will learn eventually it appreciates your feedback and you know either try again or or don't but it, it, having that sound default kind of loop is, has been really helpful in some of the designs that we've seen um, and what's some any examples of like feedback that's been taken from a bot where it's kind of change the company a little bit or they've taken like that feedback really well and then implemented the change within the bot where it came back and was able to answer that did a good yeah. job 
Yeah, and I think you bring up a, a really good point, right? With with feedback in, in learning from feedback and having those strong defaults is, you know, if you're if you have a default that says, okay, well, if the question was about a refund and I don't know how to Okay, for, for I, I'm sorry, I can't answer this question at the moment, I'm still learning, uh, but for questions about refunds, you know, email this person. That makes a huge difference because it tells yeah. me that the chatbot understood that it didn't know anything about refunds, but it knew who to point me to. So I think that yeah. is a good experience. It knew um, the general context and was able from there to say, Okay, this is me randomly not understanding what you're saying. I kind of get it. You should probably talk to this person. You know, so they yeah. Can help you out more. yeah. Yeah, I love that. Uh, but in terms of like based off of the feedback changing or, or pivoting, I think that's uh, a place where you can use feedback to collect recommendations for skills and capabilities that you want to see in your chatbot. So in addition to just you know indirectly learning from how conversations work and how you can make those improvements. So your machine learning policy or model can better generalize from it. You also have things like, well, you know, you gave me, you told me how to, you gave me a link to open a ticket, um, but it'd be really helpful if it would actually open a ticket for me. And that's how we've included that ticket, you know, functionality capability in the chapter that we built last year, because we mm -hmm. got that from user feedback. And then when we got that, when we made that integration, we reached back out to all of the users that requested that feature. We said, hey, by the way, I can open a ticket for you now. Um, why do you give it? So we're able to like close the feedback loop as well. So there are lots of ways that we've taken those and enough people request for, request a particular feature. We've implemented, integrated it, um, and then and then closed a feedback loop. So I think that is also a really valuable way to learn from user conversation. Yeah, one thing, one speech I really love that Alex often gives, uh, Alex Rafrasa, is um, this the, the bot stages, you know, the first stage, second stage, third stage, and yeah. fourth, or like the first is, is like just simple notifications, and then the fourth is being able to, it actually does stuff for you. And, and I love mm -hmm. that, that, that cycle that he talks about. Um, it's spot on. What do you think is next? What, what would you predict um, being in Rasa, seeing, you know, things that oh, a lot of the bigger enterprise clients that you've worked with, like what, what's missing? You know, what's, what's the most difficult aspects even, even still today with all the resources around and where do you kind of see the space going in the next like, two, two to five years? Yeah. Solid question. Um, I think that I, I did like a lot stuff is missing and a lot of stuff doesn't really work right now, <laughs> but we can dig into this. Uh, I think the, you know, the five levels of AI systems that, that we talk about uh, where we like outline a conversational AI maturity is, you know, like you said, level one notification, level two is just rules and if else statements. And level three is where we are right now or where we're trying to go. Cause like some people, some platforms allow you to build level three assistance. Uh, but level three is just something like you said that understands context or is able to act on contextual information and take the best the next best action based on everything that's been said before in the conversation and everything you know about the user you're able to take and actually do things for the user we're trying to make level three assistance the standard oh by the way speaking of level three assistance we are Super excited to announce our new conference, which is the Level Three uh, AI Assistant Conference. Oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, so you know, we'd love to have you, uh, you know, talk. Um, and you know, it's it's a free, fully online uh, conference, so everyone should attend. Um, but we're trying to make Level Three standard, right? So how and what's next is Level Four and Five. They're even more personalized. And level five is just like, you know, uh, a, a chatbot that can manage entire company operations. So it can like manage effectively a portion of sales or lead gen or HR or something like that. We're just trying to make level three the standard right now. Um, so we still have yeah. a long time to go. But what do, you, what do you think is the standard right now? The standard right now is still a lot of level two FAQ assistance that are based off of state machines and that 
uh, really just function based on on rules. You know, if the user says this, respond with this. And you know, this is what a typical conversation, you know, decision tree looks like. And so it's trained based on just that. So if you don't follow that path, or if you ask something else in the middle of a conversation, it doesn't necessarily understand, and it says, "Sorry, I don't." I think do you think do you think the level two sets up the right framework though to move yourself to level three, or do you think you could skip it and just start at three? Because we we see when we do the trees or have done them in the past, it, it actually provides a good backbone and structure for understanding like what the bot's capable of doing at least in the beginning to work off of. But do you think do you see in the future just starting at three and and going from there? Yeah, I mean, I think rules still are a very effective and a very easy way to help you get started just like intense i think level yeah. two even level three still need intense um we don't know what that's going to look like even though alan talked about you know we should probably get rid of intense and we don't know what that looks like just yet but you know they're really so useful in helping you get started and building minimum viable assistant that you could then start testing and using real user conversations to improve um, on. So I think you still need that and you need conversation and you need rules still. But I think you could go straight to level three and that you build something that kind of works and you test it. Level three is nothing but using tools and really use your conversations to make it better. So you yeah. could, yeah, all you have to do is just keep, keep testing it and, and keep including that feedback and retraining your model, making it better. Mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, in terms of what's also next, we've been playing around and I think a lot of researchers are talking about using transfer learning for conversational AI. So what does that look like? You know, transfer learning at its simplest is just using um, one data set or a, a, a domain and applying it in another similar domain. So if you have an assistant that knows how to book flights, um, what if you apply that to booking hotels because it's somewhat similar? So if you're able to do that, you build one one bot, one chat bot, uh, but then you can use it for two, three other use cases maybe. Um, we still have a long way to go to actually get that to work, um, but what would that look like? And um, you know, what would it look like to have no intents? I think those are two two interesting um, things that we can look look toward. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think we're starting to wrap up on time. I think, I mean, this has been great. I always love, you know, kind of catching up with you. And, Thanks. Yeah, it's making it a lot more fun. <laughs> uh, any, any last minute feedback for some of the people just getting started or that are like getting, working their way up to pitching a POC to their upper management? Uh, yeah, I'd say that, you know, conversational AI is, is not solved yet, just like if that's the one main takeaway that you can get. And we're all kind of learning together, but we are seeing uh, a lot more tools now. There's a lot more maturity in terms of tools that can help you automate, you know, things like CI CD and deployments and setting up a chatbot. And there's a lot of data that you can use and, and, and improve your chatbots. So we're all sort of like learning this together. Um, but I would say, you know, build an MVP, use like an open source platform like Raza to build an MVP and uh, try to demo it to, to people on your team, to upper management, um, and really try to make the case that you could use that to automate conversations and to, you know, see a lot of time value in, in projects like that. Nice. Yeah. Well, it has been awesome. I just have one more thing to teach you. Okay. It's this new move that I've been working on, you know, since uh, COVID-19 and everything and social distancing. Um, when, you, when you walk up to someone, you can use this if you'd like. Um, I'll use this to sign off. Um, you just walk up to them and give them kind of this like air hug slash dab. It's like... Like this? Yeah, kind of like... <laughs> I like that. That's cool. You just go to strangers and you're like, because you can't like hug each other, but you want to, but you can't. And it's like, you get it. And I'm out. <laughs>